Today I'm going to go over the chapter six comprehension questions and chapter six is a chapter that's called chemical and physical change and it has a lot in this chapter. We're going to analyze chemical versus physical changes. We're going to do some temperature conversions. You can see my formula already up on the board. You're also going to learn the main types of chemical reactions and we're going to learn how to balance some equations. So there is a lot of information that is going on in this chapter and a lot of different skills. So the first part of the chapter is wanting you to learn the difference between a chemical change and a physical change. And the definition that the book gives you, unfortunately telling the difference between a physical change and a chemical change is not always as cut and dry as most students would like. But one of the tips that the book gives you is that a chemical change cannot be easily reversed or it can't be reversed at all. And so for a physical change, you're looking for things like phase changes from like liquids to solids and things like that. Another hint that I can give you when you're looking at chemical change is anytime you're cooking or burning something, that is traditionally going to be a chemical change. So let's look at comprehension check question number one and see if we can determine if these are chemical or physical changes. The first one is crushing of an aluminum can. So if you have a soda can, it's empty and you crush it. In the end, you still have a soda can. You still have aluminum. You started with aluminum and you're ending with aluminum. And so this is just physical. Part B says digesting food. And we all I hope are familiar that you cannot undigest your food, right? And it is actually changing the compounds that your food is. As you digest food, you're pulling nutrients and vitamins and energy out of your food. And so you're taking that and you're converting that to energy. And so you are seeing a chemical change as you digest your food. Part C says cutting paper. Um, yes, you can take a piece of paper and you can cut it up to lots of little pieces and it would be very hard to reverse that, right? It would be very hard to put this piece of paper back together. But all those little pieces of paper are still paper. Their compound hasn't changed. What they are made of is not changed. You're just changing its appearance. So this is just a physical change. D is melting ice. If you have an ice cube and you set it out on the table, it is going to eventually melt. But what you started out with when it was an ice cube was water. It was H2O. It was a solid form and as it melts, it is turning into a liquid, but still H2O. You could easily reverse it. You could just take that water put it back in your freezer and you would have an ice cube again. So you're not chemically changing anything here. This is just a physical change. Part E says if you're making a hard boiled egg. If I take an egg and I cook it, what I get at the very end is very different than what you started with. Even though you are having a physical change, right? The egg is going from having a liquid yolk to a solid formed yolk or solid white. That is a physical change. But as you're cooking it, you're changing it and you cannot reverse this. I cannot uncook a hard boiled egg. So this is considered a chemical change. And part F is exploding a bomb. If I'm gonna explode a bomb, it's producing a lot of heat. And in the end, I am left with something totally different than what I started with. And in addition to that, I cannot reverse exploding a bomb. So this one is also a chemical change. So if you're in America right now, you are used to measuring things in this temperature scale called Fahrenheit. But in the sciences, we use a Celsius scale and we also use a Kelvin scale, but we don't use Fahrenheit. And so for this part of the chapter, we're going to learn how to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius and Celsius back to Fahrenheit. So your book gives you a formula that I do not require my students to memorize. You are welcome to write it on your note card to use at the end of the chapter. And I want you to learn how to use this formula. But after I show you this, I'm gonna insert a clip of me solving it on my calculator. If you are using a TI-84+, Plus, you actually have a program already in your calculator that can do these temperature conversions for you. Now you may find it easier to do it um, with the formula than to go through all the steps to get to the app on the calculator, but I want you to see that there are tools you have so that you're not having to calculate this by hand. I like the Celsius, like scientists, we like the Celsius scale. It makes more sense. Water on the Celsius scale um, freezes at zero degrees Celsius and it boils at 100. Where we're dealing with Fahrenheit, we have weird numbers like 32 is its freezing point of water and 212 is the boiling point. 
And so Celsius is really kind of nice. And how they developed the Celsius scale is they used a version of a thermometer and measured the temperature at which put a mark on the thermometer where water was freezing. Then they brought it to a boil, put a mark on the thermometer where it was boiling, and then they divided that difference between 100. So it's actually a really nice scale to use instead of the Fahrenheit scale, but it feels a little bit weird at first. Temperature is a physical property since we're talking about physical changes and chemical changes, and it is a physical property of compounds. And so we're gonna be able to learn to convert negative 76 Fahrenheit to Celsius. And the equation that you're given in the book, Fahrenheit equals nine over fifths times the degrees in Celsius, plus 32. And you can use this equation to solve for either Fahrenheit or to solve for the Celsius. Now, if you're like me, you get frustrated sometimes putting in fractions into your calculator because when you put a fraction into your calculator, you have to use parentheses. But if you don't wanna do that, you can put into your calculator 1.8. If you sit right now with your calculator and you say nine divided by five, you'll get that it equals 1.8. It's the same thing. I personally prefer to not use fractions unless I have to. But I'm, I work through this. I'm going to do it the same way the book does it so it doesn't confuse you. But just know that instead of nine fifths, you can sub in 1.8. The formula that they give you for this one, it is a solving for Fahrenheit. So we're going to rework it so that we're actually solving for Celsius because that's what the question is asking you for. So to solve it for Celsius, I basically am going to be moving all this stuff over here. So the first thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take away 32. So I've got Fahrenheit minus 32 equals 9 fifths times degrees Celsius. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide it by 9 fifths. I'm going to divide this side by 9 fifths. Now, if you'll remember when you're dividing by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. So I'm going to take it and flip it. And you flip it, you get 5 ninths times, and this is your Fahrenheit, minus 32 equals degrees Celsius. So this is like the second of this equation. You can write both of those down on your note card if you need to. I'm just gonna start over here where my board is neat and clean. And for five nights, I'm gonna put in under Fahrenheit, 76 degrees. Now remember, it's a negative. And you're just going to plug in your information and negative 76 and negative 32 and you get negative 60 degrees Celsius and so this is doing this the long way and now I'm going to cut in and add in the video of me showing you how to do it on your calculator. It's important for you to know how to do this by hand using the formula, but I also want to take a minute and show you how to use your calculator because your calculator is an amazing tool that can help you with this. Sorry about the shadow that you're getting from my hand, but if you're using a TI-84 plus CE, which I, most of my students are using, which I recommend because it is a great calculator to use also on the ACT, but what you're going to do is you're going to turn your calculator on and you're going to come down here to this apps button right here and you're going to push the apps button from the apps button i'm going to scroll down and you can see you have lots of different applications that are on here that you've probably not actually ever used and i would encourage you to come through and look at it but you have one called scientific tools and so you're going to go on this one and select scientific tools and you get this thing that just says press any key so press any key for move on to the next screen and on the scientific tool i have a significant figure calculator you're going to see a unit conversion and you're going to want to come down to this unit converter and this is going to be what you're going to use as a unit converter now your calculator can do a lot of different unit conversions you're going to see length area volume but what we're going to be using is the temperature one to be doing Fahrenheit to Celsius. So click on temperature. Now you have here, you've got a degree Celsius that you're gonna use in this class, a Kelvin's Fahrenheit, and then you actually have an R that you probably will never use. So don't worry about the R. But on this screen, you're gonna make sure that it is in whatever you're starting with. So 
for this comprehension check question, we're actually starting with negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in Fahrenheit to start with, and I'm gonna put in negative 76. Now I'm gonna hit the enter button, and it's gonna automatically put this in scientific notation. So if you'll see, I've got negative seven, 0.6 times e to the one, that's scientific notation degrees Fahrenheit. So now I'm going from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So up here, see I can move my arrows over and put it in the degrees Celsius. And I can merely just hit enter. And it gives me degrees Celsius, but you will notice that it is in um, scientific notation. So if you wanted to take this temperature out of this application, you're gonna need to use the export button. And so you would export it by going to zoom. And when you push zoom, nothing really happens, but it is actually exporting this back to the main screen of your calculator. And so now we're gonna just simply exit out. And so I'm gonna to come to the quit, which since the quit is in blue above mode, I'm gonna hit second mode and I'm actually back out more out of this app and now I'm still in the app but you'll see the exit button so I'm just simply going to hit the exit button and it takes my temperature back into the regular part of your calculator and so in Celsius negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit is a negative 60 Celsius. So I'm gonna do it again, I'm gonna do it backwards. I'm gonna put negative 60 degrees Celsius in there just to show you one more time. So in your calculator, you're gonna to go to your apps. From your apps, you're gonna scroll down. You're looking for the scientific tools and you get this button. You just have to hit any key here. You're gonna come down and go to the unit converter. Oops, passed it. For this one, we're converting temperature. And since I'm going to do this opposite, I'm going to start in Celsius. So it's already in Celsius. So I'm going to say negative 60 and I hit enter and that's just entering the data as Celsius, as you can see down here and come over here to Fahrenheit, which is where I'm going. And it gives it to me as negative 7.6 times 10 to the one, which is the scientific notation for the temperature in Fahrenheit. So remember, if you want to export this back out, you go to the export button, which is the zoom button and nothing happens. And so now we need to exit out or quit this app. So second quit or second mode, I'm gonna do it again. Now I have an exit button, which is coming to this button below here, which is Y11. So when I do that, I get negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit. So for question number three, that's what down here, but I'm gonna look it up here first, is we're talking about this physical change that we were talking about at the beginning of the chapter. A lot of times the physical change is a phase change. And so the main phases that we're gonna look at are solid, liquid, and gas. There are two others, plasma and Bose-Einstein condensates that you're not gonna be expected to cover. But the three main ones, and you've probably been hearing about these since you were in middle school, is a solid, a liquid, and my really bad drawing of a gas. And so as you're having these phase changes, and what I mean by phase changes is if I'm going from a solid to a liquid, my ice is melting. Or if I'm going from a liquid back to a solid, I'm freezing it. And if you're going from a liquid to a gas, we're doing evaporation. But if we're going from a gas to a liquid, we're doing condensation. That's that cold cup outside on a hot day when you get all the liquid on the outside of it. And then there's one that you don't see very often called sublimation and your teacher may bring in some dry ice and let you play with it. And that is going from a solid straight to a gas and that's called sublimation. So anytime we have these phase changes, we are actually either adding heat into the system or taking heat away. So as things are doing something like evaporating, as water is going from being a liquid and it's evaporating into the gas, it's actually taking heat out of it. Or sometimes you're putting heat into the system. And so that's what question number three is wanting you to know. And so it's telling you, you have two 
things of alcohol and water, and they are of the same temperature. And you can easily do this at home. You can do it with rubbing alcohol, or you can just do it with hand sanitizer. To get it into the same temperature, you're just gonna have it sitting in the same room for a few minutes so that it comes to room temperature of whatever your room is at. And you're gonna put, and it says you put a finger in each. Can you feel a temperature difference? Is one colder than the other if they're both sitting in liquids at the same temperature? And no, you're not gonna feel a temperature difference. But as you pull your hands out or your fingers out of the liquid, you pull them out at the same time, one of them feel cooler than the other. And the one that will actually feel cooler than the other is the alcohol. And the reason that you're gonna have alcohol cooling down, and you've noticed this if you've ever put hand sanitizer on your hands, your hands feel cooler, is the alcohol is doing the evaporation where it goes from a liquid to a gas, and it does it faster. Since alcohol evaporates faster, it's gonna cool that finger a lot quicker, and so that one is going to feel cooler than the other. Before we get on to part four, you're gonna introduce to the kinetic theory of matter. And kinetic is moving, it's moving energy. And so for the kinetic theory of matter, we're using this theory to describe the movement of the particles in a solid, a liquid, and in a gas. The theory says that particles have space between them, but by particles, I mean atoms or molecules, that they are always moving, and that the hotter they get, the more they are moving. And so is, as we have our solid, our liquid, and our gas, I know that a solid, the particles, I mean, if you think of a solid, it's not moving, right? If you had an ice cube sitting there, solid, hard, frozen, it doesn't, it's not moving like a liquid, it's not flowing. Now, what is happening is those particles, they are vibrating a little bit in a solid, so there's always movement, they're never not moving, but they are actually moving, just vibrating in their spot. Also in a solid, you're gonna have them closer together. So they're gonna be pulled closer together for most compounds, except water, water breaks the rules on this one. Um, and then when we get to a liquid, our molecules get more energy into them. They're moving around, they flow. If you have a water, the molecules can be moving all around your glass. And they're, they're taking up more space than they are in the solid phase, with the exception of water. As we move on to the gas phase, our molecules get further apart because they get more energy. And as they get more energy, they're bouncing around all over the place and they spread apart. And typically the more energy these molecules have, the hotter they all are. And so this is called the kinetic theory of matter. And one of the ways that we also show this is we call it a graph of a heating curve. Now it is kind of confusing because the graph as we graph this, it isn't an actual curve. It's really more like a stair-stepped line. And so that can somewhat be confusing because we do call it a curve. When you have a heating curve, your bottom axis is the heat that's been added to the sample. Your book doesn't give you any units for this. And your Y axis is its temperature. So like you're gonna have zero degrees Celsius and you may, I'm gonna make 50. 75 and let's say up to 100 degrees Celsius and it would keep going and the heat added is being increased. So a way of envisioning this is if you have an ice cube and you put it in a pot on your stove and you're constantly adding heat to it. So as it progresses, what happens? When I start out, I'm less than zero degrees. So let's say I'm down here. This is my ice cube. As I heat it up to zero degrees, it starts to melt. While it's melting, it stays zero degrees. As long as there's ice in that water, if I'm stirring it, it will be zero degrees. Now, once it is all melted and I no longer have like solid ice down here, I come up to my liquid phase. And as I'm constantly adding heat to my liquid phase, so this is it as a liquid. And once water gets to 100 degrees, it starts to turn to a gas. Once it's turned into a gas or that vaporized, it can keep going up. So this part would be called vaporizing. Down here, we have it melting. And so as you can see, this is called a curve, even though it doesn't really look like a curved shape. 
I'm just graphing it as my ice is melting and turning into water vapor. I'm gonna erase this to start for question four. So question four tells you that we're doing the heating curve of an unknown substance. So I don't know the temperature that it melts and that type of thing. But it's telling me this, the first part of information it tells you is it tells you the temperature rises steadily and stays constant at 15 degrees Celsius for a while. So we're gonna say, we're gonna put this at 100 and then let's just put 15 degrees Celsius. And I know my units are not gonna be equally dispersed, but it rises and it stays constant at 15 degrees Celsius for a while. Then my temperature is increasing again and it stops at 234 degrees Celsius. So I'm gonna come up here to 200. 34 degrees Celsius, so it goes up. And when it gets to 234, it stops rising in temperature. If you look, this is as this is our heating curve, as we're gonna call it, while something is melting, it stays the same temperature throughout until like if it's ice, all the ice is melted in your ice water, then the temperature will start to go up. The reason this happens is if you have water and you have ice on the stove and you're adding heat to the bowl, the heat is gonna go to melt the ice, not raise the temperature of the water it's in the mixture first. And so it's gonna hold a steady temperature while it's melting. Now, once it's all into that liquid phase, it is going to drastically go up in temperature until it has a phase change again and it vaporizes. And so these flat level are where you're actually seeing a phase change. So the question is asking me at what temperature is this substance melting and at what temperature is it vaporizing? While it's holding steady and having a phase change for melting at 15 degrees Celsius, and then it's vaporizing at the 234 degrees Celsius. The vaporizing, this is the same as boiling. Boiling would be another way of saying that. Question number five is asking about natural gas and your house may have a gas stove. You also may have a gas fireplace or your heat may be run off of natural gas. But now if you go turn your gas stove on, you'll notice a actual gas or a vapor is coming out of the stove. I mean gas not as an automobile or car liquid gas, like a vapor that you cannot see but you can smell it. It's gonna be coming out of your stove. Now, when these gas or the natural gas companies have it in their storage facilities, they actually store it as a liquid and they convert it from a liquid to a gas before it gets to your house. Question is asking, why do they store it as a liquid? Gas particles or gas molecules are very far apart and they take up a lot of space. But if I take those gas molecules and I push them together, I can get them really closer together into a liquid. And so a hundred, which is a very small number, gas molecules, if I put them as a liquid, they take up a lot less space. So if the natural gas company stores it as a liquid, it is a lot less volume that they are having to store. When we move on to question six of the comprehension checks, you get introduced to chemical equations. And chemical equations feel very overwhelming at first because there is a lot of information in a chemical equation. So I have written the one for six part A up here. A first part of a chemical equation you're gonna have on the left side, we have it, we call it the reactants, but it's what you're starting with. If you're baking a cake, your reactants are gonna be flour, sugar, eggs, butter, those are your reactants. On the right side, we have your products, which if you're baking a cake, you produced hopefully a cake or cupcakes, right? And in the middle, we have an arrow and we call it say yield for the arrow. You may have people say equals. That's a little misleading because actually sometimes you can run these reactions the other way and pull them back in the other direction. And so you would just flip your arrow. But so reactants yield products. Now you studied in a previous chapter, a concept called conservation of mass, which is matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And so as we proceed on through these reactions or this chemical equation, we need to make sure that we're not losing anything or we're not creating something out of nothing. Because if I am baking a cake and I don't put any eggs in it, when I pull it out of the oven, it is not magically going to have eggs at the end. 
So what I start with, I have to make sure that is what I have in the end. That is making sure mass is conserved throughout the equation. Now, some of the parts that you're gonna have of these equations is you're gonna see phase symbols. So you have a tiny little s, which stands for solid. So for this example, I have a compound, FES, and it is in its solid form. We also have a gas phase here. Sometimes you're gonna see a liquid. And then sometimes you're gonna see an AQ, which stands for aqueous, which basically means it's dissolved in water. And so sometimes these chemical equations, when they add all the phase symbols, they get very complicated and very confusing. So I'm actually gonna go and erase the phase symbols, but so it clears it up some, but I want you to make sure you understand why they're there. Now, this question is asking you to see, is it balanced? And by balanced, what it means is, is what you start with, the same thing that you end with. And then the next step is you're gonna learn how to balance these yourselves. So just check yourself to see if this is a balanced equation. We're gonna determine what, what are on the reactant side of the equation and what is on the product side of the equation. So the first reactant is there's a four in front and we have an FES. So this FE stands for iron and the S is sulfur. Iron sulfide is your compound and we have four of them. This number out front, we call a coefficient. And it tells me how many I have. I have four of this compound. The next reactant I have is seven oxygens. And if you'll remember, oxygen is a homonuclear diatomic so that's why this little two here. And when it's little, it's called a subscript and it is part of a compound. So as we're balancing equations, we're gonna be able to change the amount of FES. Like if I have too much, I could take one of these away, but I'm not ever gonna change the subscripts or the little two. So for my seven O2s, there's seven of them. So one, two, three, should draw them smaller, four, five, six, seven. That's a lot of oxygens, right? That's a total of 14 oxygens. For the products, I have a compound that has two irons and three oxygens. Now, this is not what they look like. You have learned how to draw some Lewis structures, so you know Fe. 203 does not look like this, but for the E's, I'm gonna do it this way. Now, the next product that we have is we have, and there's two of these, so I drew two of them. The next product we have is sulfur, and there's an oxygen. Those are both non-metals, so those are covalent compounds, so I would say it's sulfur dioxide, and I have four of those. This is what I'm gonna to use to represent one sulfur and two oxygens. But I have four of this compound. To check to see if it's balanced, we're gonna make sure we have the same that we start with being the same that we end with. You do not have to draw this out the long way, but I'm starting with, I have a total of four FEs and four sulfurs, right? and I have a total of 14 oxygens. So I need to make sure that I end up with four Fe's, four sulfurs, and 14 oxygens. If not, I have either lost or created mass and that cannot happen. And so this is not a balanced out reaction. And so I would either need to add some extras or take some away so that I start with what I end with. I have one, two, three, four. I have four Fe's here. And when we count oxygens, I'm gonna count all the oxygens in the product. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 oxygens and four sulfurs. So I started with four irons and I end with four irons. I started with four sulfurs and I'm ending with four sulfurs and I'm started with 14 oxygens 
and I'm ended with 14 oxygens. So this compound on 6A is a balanced equation. So the answer is yes, it is balanced. 6B, I need to remember that my green marker does not really erase. But we have another equation and the question is asking, is it balanced or not? So I have left off the phase symbols just to make it a little bit simpler on my board. Now, I am gonna do this one a little bit different. I am not gonna go through this one with colors and trying to draw out all the atoms. I'm just gonna show you how to calculate it. So the first compound we have carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens in it. And if I wanna know how many carbons I have, I have two. There's not a coefficient out here. So I only have one of this compound and in it, it has two carbons. Since I only have one of this compound, but in it, it has six hydrogens and it also has in it one oxygen. But on the reactant side of this equation, I have some more oxygens right here. Remember oxygen, homonuclear diatomic, it's never alone. So that's why we have O2, but I have four O2s. So total, I have eight oxygen. So there's a total here of nine oxygens on the, on the reactant side. So now let's calculate it for the products. So for carbon, and I'm just gonna keep them the same across. So I'm gonna figure out how many carbons I have. Now, this compound is carbon dioxide, and I have two of the compounds. So in each compound has one carbon, but I have two of them. So I have a total here of two carbons. Now for the hydrogens, there's no hydrogens in this product, but there is in this one. I hope you recognize this as water. And every water has two hydrogens, but I don't have one water, I have three. So since I have three, like three, you can assume molecules at this point, I have three waters, I have a total of six hydrogens. Now I'm gonna figure out my oxygens so in this compound, each compound, each one has two oxygens, but I have two. So I have four oxygens here. And in each water only has one oxygen, but I have three of them. So I have three. And so there's a total of seven oxygens on this side of the equation. So to see if it's balanced, you're going to check. And so we each have two carbons. I have six hydrogens, but my oxygens don't match up, right? I have nine oxygens and I have seven oxygens. So the answer to 6B is no, this is not a balanced equation. Let's take this one step further that is not on the thing and let's make it balanced. So if you'll look this side, everything's balanced but the oxygens. And over here, I have too, too many oxygens. So if I could lose two oxygens on this side, I would be good to go. I'm not gonna take two from this compound because it would change the compound and I don't wanna do that. And there's only one oxygen. But what if instead of having four O2s here, we only had three. So it's like we have one oxygen model, two, three. So this would give me a total of six oxygens plus one and I would have seven. So that would make that a balanced chemical equation.